uh, we just asked uh, the experts, and it actually is good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this very special panel that uh, we at ITFA are proud to host. We have two wonderful people uh, in uh, these portrait mode screens on the right and the side, four others in the middle, in flash, live, and next to me is Vladan Petkovic, the uh, amazing friend, colleague, who initiated this great uh, uh, beginning of something, of an examination, of a questioning. It's just to, to say a few words, if you all allow me. Um, I'm quite fed up with the question of diversity. That's basically because I'm usually called a diverse festival director. And my own diverseness is uh, a very interesting point because I, uh, it feeds into my own uh, paradoxes, you know. So I feel like I'm not that diverse, I'm just one. Uh, but they actually mean that I'm diverse from what's expected. And I have to examine what do you mean what's expected and why am I not what's expected? What exactly is happening here? And I get lost and I feel a bit angry. In criticism, there's something very, there's a living challenge for filmmakers and for festivals or festival organizers like myself. It actually is this continuous attempt to say, stop measuring us to a standard or to a ruler that we do not understand. And that, I think, is something I'm very curious to see our great panelists examine, I hope. The whole point of film being made for the world, for humanity, versus being made for a successful market that we know that has its own paradigms, its own measures, its own rules, is a very interesting point because I think this is the next step of examining how the world can truly be different. This all comes, this comes in every aspect of what we do, in the films themselves, in the festivals and their selection processes, in criticism, which has so far been saved a lot of this discussion or escaping the discussion. So I'm very appreciative, Vladan, that you invite these wonderful people and you make good use of the platform that is ITFA to start examining the position of film critics and criticism in this uh, new era. So what is it about that you want to do here? Or everybody, I don't know. I'm just very curious and deeply honored to welcome all of you. Uh, so thank, thank you so much. I hope the world will be just a little, 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 little bit more welcoming of weirdos like myself after you finish this panel. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Uh, thank you for this uh, nice introduction and also for the trust and support. So uh, I'm a film critic and a journalist. Uh, some of you know me. Uh, here at ITFA, I write uh, articles for the website. And uh, when I used to spend my time mostly traveling around festivals and writing about films and doing everything around films except making them, and when the pandemic started and I found myself sitting at a computer all day watching a screener and then writing the review on this same computer and this kept going on and going on, uh, you start wondering what's the purpose of it. And in the mix of that is also, was also uh, just being on social media too much and noticing uh, these so-called, let's say, ideological wars around particular films or uh, uh, particular filmmakers. And uh, I thought this is not a conversation that should be on social media because film criticism is not supposed to be a fasting, uh, highly polarized uh, extremist. It should, it's a place of nuance and insight and reflection. And this is something that uh, uh, I want us to talk about. 
Uh, and what is the, uh, yes, I, and on the other hand, we, we are in this conversation about uh, who, is in front of, who is in front of the camera, who is behind the camera, who is the gatekeeper for, for these films. So I think it's just as important to uh, speak about uh, who gets to write about what kind of films in what kind of outlets. And this is where I think these different lines of the role of film criticism in the society kind of converge. So uh, I've gathered these great people here uh, for, uh, for the, uh, to start this conversation, and we are not expecting any, to find any solutions. We just think it's a conversation that should be directed by people who know what it is about and that it should be ongoing. And I hope we will be taking this to more festivals in the future. So, uh, for a start, uh, my friend and inspiration, Giri Shambu, will do a keynote and then the panel will start. Thank you. Hello. Um, I'd like to thank Vladen, Orva, and uh, Idva for gathering us here for what I'm sure is going to be a very exciting conversation. Uh, my talk is going to be short, and I'd just like to raise a few ideas, and perhaps some of them may be of use. We'll see. I've structured this talk uh, as three brief parts. I'm thinking today of Vittorio De Sica's romantic comedy, Yesterday, Today, and Tomorrow, with Sofia Loren and Marcello Mastroianni. And so the three sections are going to be past, present, and future. So section one where has film criticism been in the last century or so, very quickly. Part two, where is it today in the last decade or so? And three, what would we like film criticism to be in the future? So part one, yesterday. For most of the 20th century, all over the world, including the Euro-Western world, we have had a relatively small number of film critics writing for a large audience, a large number of viewers. In film culture, many of these critics um, have become well-known, larger than life, even heroic figures, because there were relatively so few of them. Think of Cahiers du Cinema in the 1950s. Critics like Truffaut, Godard, Romer, Rivette, and of course their mentor André Bazin, and the revolution that they created in cinephilia and film criticism. When I discovered these writers as a teenager growing up in Kolkata in India, I was so moved and compelled by their words, um, their view of cinema, which was so assertively expressed, and their ambition, which was so grand, that they became my critical heroes. Even though we were thousands of miles apart, I felt that distance collapse. I felt one with them. But it was foolish of me to think that because despite my admiration for those critics who addressed the world in such a charismatic way, there was an ocean of difference between us. These writers whom we regard as geniuses today in the history of cinema and the history of film criticism came from a very narrow background, a pretty small slice of humanity. They were mostly male, white, heterosexual, from bourgeois families, Catholic. But even though they came from a small minority group, they wrote with such universalist authority that they managed to convince the world that their concerns should occupy um, center stage, and that those concerns should be universal concerns. Meanwhile, the experiences and perspectives of others, women, black, indigenous people of color, queer folks, disabled people, remained mostly out of sight, invisible in the margins as critics. Part two today. So where is film criticism today? A few weeks ago, uh, two scholars, Patricia Aufderheide and Marissa Woods, 
published a research report on the state of journalism in the documentary filmmaking scene today. It came out in September and it's available online. And they interviewed more than 70 professionals in North America. And here are some of the main problems they found in documentary film criticism today in North America. And maybe we can talk about how generalizable these findings are to the rest of the world. They found most documentary film criticism, unsurprisingly, is still overwhelmingly white and male. There is a real felt need of, for um, a diversity of critics who can read films through the lens of their own unique lived experience. Especially in the case of major mainstream outlets, it's very difficult for black, indigenous, people of color, LGBTQ writers to be hired and it is hardest for women of color. Um, because of the skewed nature of the landscape of film criticism, the films themselves are not often served well. For example, when you have a film about disability made by disabled creators, which is then reviewed by a non-disabled critic, that critic, even if well-intentioned, um, simply might not have the lived knowledge, the embodied experience to do justice to that film. Um, and so many of those films might get blocked or lost in the pipeline from, the, from production to the viewer. But at the same time, no critic wants to be confined within the parameters of their own identity and not be allowed to write with the freedom that white men have always enjoyed. Part three, tomorrow. What do we want film criticism to be? And what do we want it to do? We want greater diversity, representation, inclusion. But these words are also loaded words. They have now acquired meanings that are both good and problematic. Because these ideas can be enacted in a superficial rather than a deep way in organizations. What does it look like to have true, meaningful, complex diversity and inclusion in film criticism with marginalized voices that have decision-making authority? I'm sure we will talk about this today. The future of film criticism has to be one that is a large collective project, not just a few heroic dominant voices. A project where we each bring our own special perspectives, experiences, and lived knowledge. We also need a multiplicity of locations, by which I mean not just geographic locations, but also institutional locations. We are seeing in the academic world today a strong push by institutions for public scholarship, public-facing writing, that makes an impact on a large general readership. This is an opportunity to enlist scholars who spend their lives researching certain pockets of cinema in depth and getting them to write in a way that is broadly accessible and can help start debates in film culture. One great challenge facing critics today is that it's hard to be only a film critic any longer. More and more, a film critic needs to wear multiple hats, that of a cultural critic, a social critic, a political critic, and so on, which is incredibly hard. The critic and curator Abby Sun argued in a piece that she wrote earlier this year for Berlin Critics Week that film criticism also needs to take up and address not just the film in front of the critic, but also the ecosystem that surrounds it. So issues of production, distribution, exhibition, and crucially, labor throughout this ecosystem. This is a crucial issue because most film critics today struggle to make a living, to find full-time work. And there are a lot of underpaid and unpaid workers throughout this ecosystem. And so, how can we collectively shape the creation of an ecosystem that is fair and just? Because in addition to the words that have currency now 
at events such as this, words like diversity, representation, inclusion, we also need a serious consideration of the word, the idea, the practice of justice. I look forward to being part of this conversation with you. Thank you. Just checking if this is working. <laughs> Um, thank you so much, um, Girish, for the wonderful um, keynote speech, which I'm sure will open up a lot of avenues for our discussion today. Um, just a quick introduction. Um, my name is Phuong Le, and I'm a Vietnamese um, film critic based in Paris. And I'm very thrilled um, to welcome everyone here and to be moderating this panel we have today on um, presentation and diversity in film criticism. Um, so from on my right, on the monitor, we have Devika Girish calling in from New York. Um, she's the code um, deputy editor of Film Comment, and um, Girish Shambu, who um, the editor of uh, Film Quarterly Quorum column um, from the U.S. And on my left, we have Orish Aikawolo. <laughs> um, very sorry. Um, he's an African um, film media consultant and critic. He's a contributing writer for The Film Verdict, and he's coming from Nigeria. Um, then we have Finn Halligan. She's a chief film critic and reviews editor for um, Screen International uh, from the UK. And on the screen, uh, we have Katarina Hedren. Uh, she's a freelance film critic and curator um, based in South Africa. So thank you so much for joining us today. And um, I, I want to get into just the logistics of diversity in criticism, criticism first. Um, in your, in your uh, speech, you were talking about feeling an ocean between um, the Kahiru cinema critics and yourself as a marginalized um, critic. And I think that gap is in the logistical sense, can be seen in the way it's hard for people to go to film festivals if you're not based um, in Western countries. And I know ours. Uh, actually has a visa issue that almost prevented him to join us today. And I wonder, Arish, if you could talk about what you think is the role of the film festival in facilitating greater access for critics. Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's a bit of a, it's a bit, um, I guess, tricky to um, pretty much pass how this works. <clears throat> Essentially, I mean, I grew up in Lagos, which is this big city in, Nigeria in Africa, and um, it's, I mean, we, I mean, generally in the country, we make a lot of jokes about how difficult it is to travel if you're Nigerian. Um, part of the problem being that um, there is just this idea, somewhat, that I guess you do not quite belong to certain spaces. And um, if you're coming from a poor country, I guess it's probably even worse. Um, specifically about um, IDFA this time. I think the problem was not a lot of people are aware that people write about film in Nigeria. So I think one of the first things, I guess, with the embassy people, um, and it's a bit tricky because it's not even the Dutch embassy, it's the French embassy because in Nigeria, the Dutch embassy doesn't handle visas. It is the French embassy that handles um, visas for people going to um, the Netherlands. So I think part of the problem is the guys at the, at the embassy, I'm assuming that it's just them. Um, when they see you pretty much present the documents um, and it has the word film critic there and it's a festival, I think for them they're like, how exactly? I mean, I think there's a bit of dis um, dissonance there. They can't quite get how you are, uh, where you fit in in a festival, in a festival in Europe. I think there is that dissonance. So that's, I think, already puts I guess there's always a bit of caution, I guess, once they, once they see your visa application. And so it becomes a bit tricky to like get them to see that, you know what, I have been here several times. One of the things I was hoping that would happen would be that they would go through my passport yeah. and see that there are other visas in it. There is, I've had like Schengen visas for the past, I don't know, five years. Um, there is one for Berlin, there is one for Rotterdam. So, I mean, there's quite a bunch of it. So I was assuming in my head that if they saw that, they would understand that this isn't quite strange, but it didn't quite happen, you know? And it's a, I mean, talk about logistics. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really, for me at least, 
it's important that the money part of this thing is discussed, the business of it is discussed. Um, there's a joke in Nigeria that the Lagos embassy for the, um, for the, for the US uh, pretty much funds every other embassy <laughs> because the idea is people um, apply several times. So I think the visa for coming here was about 80, just the direct visa, besides every other thing, the time you spend and everything, just the direct visa itself is 80 euros. You know, you're applying. And like I said, it's not a rich country. 80 euros is not something you see on the ground. So you have 80 euros, and then if I was to apply a second time, it would be only on 60 euros, all before I, even have, even, all before I talk about the ticket. So um, luckily, um, thanks to Vladan, um, it was possible for me to get the visa without applying a second time. But I keep thinking about it. If I had to apply the second time, and if I had to fund myself here, I do not have a lot of um, publications that will be willing to consider those as expenses. And so it becomes incredibly difficult for me to show up at a major festival and write about it for these publications. So how then does my voice, how then does this person who comes from Africa, how then does he get his voice heard in like the major um, spaces? So yeah, it's tricky, what I can say. Yeah, and I think you touch on sort of the commissioning process. Even if you're at a festival and you see the films, who would you pitch to? Would it be publishing um, your work? And I wonder if, Finn, you could talk a bit about your editorial commissioning process and oh, yeah. how you think editor can help um, um, diversify the pool of writers. It's, yeah, I mean, when you're talking about, you know, when you write as well, you're writing for your, your, your readers who read you and then want to be like you. And you know what I mean? We're, we're talking about access that goes down further. And this is where, uh, as, a, as a, a commissioning editor, as, as well as being a critic, that um, I can't help but see that, um, well, I mean, first of all, I'll, I'll be terribly optimistic because the, the film business shut, shut down during COVID-19, essentially, and distribution and festivals shut down. And, and when they reopened, they reopened a lot of them online and opened up access, you know? Because for me, as a commissioning editor, you know, my magazine can't afford to send a ton of people off to Cannes, and Cannes only has so many accreditations, and the, you know, the critics can't afford to go themselves. But, you know, and I think Sundance, in a way, I think we should all recognize what Sundance has done recently in leading the way in terms of trying to get unrepresented critics in and, and and open up access and they've been amazing and you know then I got a lot more critics emailing me asking me you know oh I've got I've got accreditation I'm going to be at Sundance I have you know wow for me great yeah yeah yeah. come to the table you know I mean I can't afford to send you to Park City but you know so it's it's really um I really, for me, as a, as a commissioning editor, I think of, of access, and that's the main thing. The access to me, access to festivals, access to the films, you know, that, that festivals in a way too, I say major festivals like can't, I, they're trying, I know they're trying, but you know, think hard about how their decisions play out across the, across the field that we're talking about, across the voices, across the audiences, across the filmmakers, the perceptions of the filmmakers, because we all bring to the table our life experience, as you said, and our perspectives when we're looking at these films. So it's really, really, really important. Um, Devika, do you want to talk a bit about editorial size of, of film comment? Yeah, I mean, um, I've not been commissioning for a very long time, but I, you know, I've encountered similar things to what Fiona is uh, describing. I feel like, especially with festivals and having been a, you know, I've had a variety of different roles as a freelancer attending festivals, as a critic on a staff, on, you know, uh, on staff attending festivals, as an editor. And, um, it's truly, I think, at least in the US, from my experience and from my observation, it's uh, very, very rare for a critic to be compensated to attend a festival, either by the publication or, you know, uh, sometimes festivals do it, but compensated in a way that you don't lose money. You know, I think during the think tank uh, that we had in prep for this conversation, we were all talking about how rare it is to go to a festival and not actually be in debt or, you know, the best case scenario is that you break even. And um, there's this almost understanding that going to a festival is a kind of privilege and not um, a recognition of the fact that if you're going to a festival as a critic, it is absolutely a job. Everything you're doing there is labor. You know, you're creating, uh, to use a dreaded word, but I think in this case, appropriate content 
for you know whoever you're writing for or working for and that is you know worth uh you know you being able to live and eat and sustain yourself now i mean not to you know as an editor i'm working with an assigned budget and have you know not been at least in the time that i've been commissioning been able to uh afford like funding people's travel to festivals it's also overlapped with covid so it's like been a unique situation as has been mentioned there hasn't been that much travel but something i feel very wary about is um you know you're often in the situation where people who are able to go or people who are already there are the people who can cover a festival for you in a way that is you know somewhat sustainable and you're in the position of obviously then only assigning that coverage to those people and you do have to at some point stop and wonder you know what you're reinforcing at the end of the day because then what happens is it's either a small group of people who have the ability to travel to various festivals or who are in locations like certain parts of europe who are able to access a lot of these festivals and uh there's a lot of others and myself included sometimes who uh, struggles with immigration you know uh, struggles with questions of immigration or funding and i think this is a very i uh, i'm not i think we all have a little bit of a role to play whether it's editors whether it's publications whether it's festivals but it is something that i wish uh, like girish was saying collectively we could take yeah. charge of um for instance uh, as was mentioned uh the sundance folk festival has been doing a press inclusion program that's how i got to attend it for the first time in 2019 and that was the first festival where uh i was able to attend and cover and not lose money you know uh because it was a very generous stipend it was uh, awarded globally to critics across the globe and it was an unrestricted stipend and it was done in in a very thoughtful way but that's very very rare you know i mean i haven't really come across any other program like that and so it was great that sundance decided to really invest in the idea that it needed a diverse audience to talk about its movies but i also wonder you know where does the responsibility lie does it lie with festivals um does it lie with publications and editors um i'm i'm not sure i mean i'm glad that sundance made this decision but i also don't want editors and publications publications to shirk the responsibility and transfer just to festivals i think um i think we need to think about the ecosystem as was mentioned earlier and um and somehow i don't know how but somehow you know make it not acceptable for publications and and editors to coast on you know the fact that some people are way more privileged than others in this business yeah i think there should be we discussed this in the think tank that we have um before this panel when there should be greater transparency when it comes to pay rates um with um each outlet because sometimes it's it's hard to think about this but we as a lot of freelancer or critics we sort of own in this business together and if you accept a work um for lower rate or for free you might be hurting other people um so i was just wonder in 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 this time and age when freelancers are owned around the world how do you think we can actually connect with one another and collectively organize for equity and um i just say justice do you have any um input on that um actually i'm not a, not being uh so i i should say that uh, i teach for a living and i don't work as a critic uh, for a living which i'm thankful for because i know how difficult the struggles are for uh, my friends and everyone here um that's a very good question um one thought that idly occurred to me but you can tell me if it's uh if it's practical or a dream is in in many industries workers um organize across organizations so rather than lincoln center i mean it's it's wonderful that employees of the of lincoln center and new yorker are uh, going through unionization efforts now 
uh, but is it also possible to organize across organizations by a job title? So this happens in many industries, like in my industry, academia, adjunct faculty who are part-time faculty who make very small salaries uh, organize across universities. And so that way, I think might, it might be a way for uh, critics to, to have a little more bargaining power, but maybe, maybe others can tell me if this is practical or not. Just, just very quickly, I've gone from watching when I started in my career, it, it was totally unionized. Journalism was completely unionized. I couldn't set foot in the newsroom because they were what they call closed shops. So if you weren't part of the union, you couldn't actually, and, and you couldn't touch things that belonged to other chapters of the union. To the point now, I mean, I'm very envious of the Lincoln Center being unionized. There are no no unions in, in, in the UK. and I. I, I you would have to talk to me about the rest of the US, but they were effectively in our business smashed in the UK. So, you know, you really... Katerina? Sorry, we're just talking about um, perhaps trying to organize within critics, and I wonder if you have any idea whether um, that's feasible. No, I'm, I mean, to... to, to I th I think I would be a bad person to speak on that because I don't I don't mm -hmm. live on uh, feminine criticism either because I wouldn't live and I have never uh, aspired to either. I've been lucky to have other jobs that take me to festivals and to to um, yeah, to make sure that I can do this. And I also do see the, uh, my film criticism as part part of practice like that way with curation and and and, and other contexts. So. I think, so, so I wouldn't be able to talk about like a, a, a unionization, but I do believe in what Girish talked about, this, um, this collective mindset of, of, uh, of that, of, of, uh, because I think that's part of taking, taking what we do seriously and, and if we are concerned with the multiplicity, uh, to, to have multiple voices and, and accuracy. In, 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 in film engagement, then I think the collective mindset is, is part of that, is, is inherent in that. Do you think it's possible to perhaps depend on legacy newspaper or institution to have that kind of diversity, or are we looking to create something else entirely here? I, I, I mean, I believe that there is, they have to, uh, um, when we were talking yesterday, in the yeah. time, think tank. I put my hope to, to gentrification because that's what happens, right, all the time. That you have, um, you have independent, edgy platforms that, that, that operate underground and, and eventually as established platforms, because they be, the, the, more, the less diverse they are, the less relevant they come, the, become and the, the less interesting a source they become, and then they look elsewhere. I don't trust this, obviously, to solve everything, and it's uh, far from ideal. But I don't, I don't think that from the goodness of their heart they will change. But I think that they will have to change, just the same way as the film making landscape has changed, because audiences have changed, and audiences demand other images. And I think the same thing: audiences demand other reflections. And I think that is happening. And I think eventually they will be forced to change. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not saying that in a hopeful way and saying that we should all sit and wait, but I'm, it is inevitable. It's just so annoying that it takes so much time, obviously. Yeah, I mean, I, I think personally that, um, I think it's both, both ways. I think it's important that the um, legacy publications change. I also think it's also important that some newer platforms also um, arise. Um, as I was saying, I mean, as I mentioned yesterday, um, a lot of why, on a personal note, a lot, of, a lot of why I became a critic was because I read people who were critics, and I figured, you know, this was not a terrible, I mean, as a, as a kid, of course, as a teenager, like, you know, this was not a terrible way to, to live. And I didn't, think, I, I didn't think I saw it in my culture. And I figured, you know, this would not be a terrible thing to happen within my own culture. So there's a sense in which, for me, I like the idea of legacy publications existing, thriving, I mean, just pretty much existing forever, you know? 
But I think, yeah, that Katrina is right in the sense that they need to change, and some of that change is happening, but it's incredibly slow, and the fact is, yeah, these are not, I think they're comfortable, that's another thing, you know? Um, and I think that the outsized influence, especially of the really big publications in the West, I think they'll probably live forever, to be honest, you know? <laughs> they are too big to fail. So what then that means is that if this is the elephant in the room, the idea is you can't take that elephant out of the room. What you can do then is like try and figure out, try to like um, figure out what you can do with the elephant while it's in the room, you know? And so for me, the, the thought would be, okay, can we get these guys to see what value there is in what in expanding? Or can we get them to see what value there is in changing the constitution of people who write for them? So that's an incredibly difficult thing to happen because like I said, these guys are comfortable. But yeah, so maybe part of it comes from the audience as well. Like if more people were demanding different views, maybe that would change. Um, but yeah, this doesn't of course excuse the need for like smaller edgier platforms um, to crop up. But I think that we live in a world where both things can actually exist. Um, Girish, you mentioned earlier about there's been more of a relationship between academic writings and popular journalism. Do you think that will help with diversifying the, the perspective and, and the writers? Um, that's a great question. Uh, I think it will, because if you look at the discipline of film studies, film and media studies, uh, both North America and uh, globally, um, the uh, proportion of marginalized voices, uh, women, queer people, people of color, is actually significant. And because film studies is a relatively young discipline, it started in the 1960s, uh, it doesn't have a lot of the baggage, I have to say, white male baggage, that a discipline like philosophy has, which, you know, the, the canon of philosophy is mostly white men, and people trying to replace the canon with more current thinkers in philosophy, uh, it's a very difficult struggle, and they're marginalized often. But uh, we have that problem much less in film and media studies. So the more we can uh, convince uh, scholars to write in a way that the general public wants to read them in an accessible way, I think it will automatically bring a greater diversity of uh, voices to the table. Um, that's what I think. Um, I wonder if we could talk about uh, the authenticity of film criticism, which we touched on yesterday in Think Tank, about who are allowed to write what. So is it actually, are we striving for better criticism if we only ask Asian critic to write about Asian cinema, or is diversity and authenticity in criticism manifest itself in, in different way? Um, I wonder if Devika, do you want to say something about that? Sure, yeah, I think this is a tricky question that all of us who, as Orwa uh, described at the start of this conversation, are labeled you know, diverse uh, critics or diverse people struggle with. And I think this also relates to what you know, was uh, you were just discussing about legacy institutions, right? Should we rely on them to change or should we look outside? So I just wanna say something on that for a second, which is that I may be a bit idealist here, but I, or cynical, I don't know, whichever way you look at it, but I really feel that there is um, very limited gains to be had in a reformist perspective because legacy institutions have the prestige and the status they have because they're exclusive, you know? I mean, they're gatekeepers. That's why they seem, you know, so hallowed. And so by definition, I think that their practice is not inclusive and even when uh, they hire diverse critics and they hire different voices. I'm not sure if that fundamentally changes their structure, if that fundamentally changes the kind of um, institution they represent in society, the voice of criticism they represent. And I'm not sure if the critics working, you know, the critics who are hired um, to kind of increase the diversity of voices are able to write in the full-fledged manner that all critics should, and that, as Girish said, white men have for a long time. So you'll often hear stories from critics hired at these institutions that they become tokens, right? And they become 
the mouthpiece for authenticity, like Hong, what you're describing, they become a way for the critic to expand the publication's um, you know, scope of coverage or, or a way for the critic to say, well, you know, we're gonna hire a person of this background to write about this particular film so that we have that sort of essentialist stamp of authority. And I'm not sure if that's, that's uh, good. Like um, I was talking yesterday, you know, some of the publications I work for, some of the legacy publications that I've written for, um, I'll be asked to review Bollywood films, uh, like contemporary Bollywood films and contemporary Bollywood is actually not really much of an interest of mine uh, or really, you know, something I have that much expertise in. There are people who have, you know, more expertise than me. And so I'll begrudge that a little bit and I'm not really sure if I want to do it. But then I realized that the alternative would be the person who's done it at that publication for, you know, decades and I, who is not culturally informed in the same way. And so I think, okay, better me than them, you know? And so that's like a tightrope of, um, I actually want to contribute to contribute my lived experience and you know my cultural experience and contribute to producing more informed criticism. At the same time, I want to be able to live the kind of full critical and journalistic life that you know a lot of other critics do get to live. And I would want to be you know seen as able as authoritative on, on subjects. Um, that go beyond what is like immediately visible about me as a critic or, you know, what my identity immediately telegraphs. And so I, it's, it's really, yeah, it's a, it's a difficult road. And I think it speaks to larger questions we're having in culture about, you know, between being essentialist and between being inclusive, you know, so how do we, uh, think of a diverse collective of voices and different lived experiences being valued without assuming that lived experience is the only kind of worthy experience or that lived experience is above learned experience, you know? And I think that's something people of color like us face where lived experience is, it's either not valued at all or it's completely overvalued and the idea that we could just be erudite critics who you know learned about other kinds of cinema in the ways that everyone does you know through educating ourselves um is also possible like fang you were saying yesterday that you don't really write about vietnamese films you're more interested in classic cinema and that's maybe not something that people uh instinctively expect from you right yeah, and I think it might also have to do with social media in a way, because now that there are so many freelancer and critics, you have this impulse to brand yourself as something, so that when people commission a piece on something, they think of you. And if you're visible online in a way that's sort of racially visible, if, they, if someone wants to do something Asian-related, like, oh, I know that one Asian person who's around, um, no, so, that's, uh, it's just gonna, it just makes me laugh because there was a point where I had very young children and I was like the only female film critic with children, like as far as I could see in, in, on the globe. And I got every animated feature, you know. I was watching cartoons, you know, <laughs> essentially for years to the point where I can't even watch them anymore. I just like, I don't need Disney to tell me about my family values. And, you know, I just got like that after about four years. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, uh, are we um, perhaps should consider um, the the role immigration plays in all of this? Because I think that, frankly, I have absolutely no problem um, if anybody said, you know what, there is I don't know an African film, there's a Nigerian film. <clears throat> so I mean, where I come from, there's a tradition of film called Nollywood, and the fact is, I live in Nigeria. I was born and raised in Nigeria. I still live in Nigeria, so I never schooled anywhere else but Nigeria. So what this gives me, to be honest, is an incredible amount of perspective on practically anything about Nollywood, which is like the dominant. Um, in fact, I hope there's a Nollywood documentary here someday. You know, but the idea is for me, because I live on the continent, because I was raised on the continent, I have such an incredible grasp of the film tradition of my country. So if anybody, New York Times, I don't know, Vols Grant, anybody asked me to write about Nollywood, I don't know, for like five years, I have absolutely problem doing it because <clears throat> I honestly feel like I know this thing a lot more than anybody else does because I have been there. The thing practically started commercially in 1992. Of course, there were films before that, but commercially, um, we say it's 92. 
92 I was already alive, you know. <laughs> so by the time I was uh, 10, I had seen a ton of these films. And so I know them. So I know the movement. Say, for instance, old Nollywood, new Nollywood, whatever's going to happen in the future, I probably have an idea. So if I was asked, it wouldn't be a problem for me, frankly. But at the same time, I agree that you want to be vast because at the same time, as much knowledge as I have about these things, I can also give you a full-on lecture on a Tarantino film. I can give you a lecture on a Terrence Malik film, you know? So there's all of these things. But the fact, but the fact is, yes, I think that if we think about immigration as a part of what probably alters a person's, um, I guess, likes or the person's um, preferences, maybe that would color it a bit. Because like I said, because I still live on the continent, because I was born and raised there, the fact is I have absolutely no problem being the guy who you think about when you talk about Nollywood, because I do know it. I think it leads to the back to quite a loaded question, but what's the function of film criticism? Because when it comes to a kind of essentialist viewing of critics of color writing about certain kind of movie, is like teach us about this. And is that the function of film criticism? Perhaps, but I think unless we really get into the bottom of like why people reading criticism and why diversity is important, in that is kind of really hard to narrow down what we mean diversity in terms of writing itself. And Girish, do you wanna start over with that? Uh, sure, I can, I can give it a shot. Um, I, guess, um, I guess I see the function of film criticism in, in kind of this two-pronged way. Um, an aesthetic function that helps viewers appreciate the film in a certain, with a certain depth. Uh, taking account of its aesthetics in a detailed way, you know, a deep aesthetic appreciation of a film. And then the social function of criticism, because cinema is so linked to the world and depicts the world, um, you know, so vividly, um, I think it should also educate and incite conversations among viewers and in audiences. So this aesthetic and social function, I think they often, um, the best criticism for me, um, works on both of those levels at, you know, uh, at the same time, rather than only providing me one. So that's what I would say is my, kind of my personal uh, view on that. Ours? I don't know, I mean, I've, <clears throat> such a tricky question, to be honest. Um, I think, I think you're entirely correct. There is, of course, that. You know, but um, I think as someone who, I mean, I'm more, I'm not quite associated with the academia, so I think a lot about like the daily or the weekly film critic. That guy is really my guy, you know. That lady is my lady, you know. So that's what I think about. And for that, I think you want some kind of context, uh, depending on the film again, you know. There's the aesthetic part, like you mentioned. There's the social part. But I think that when you strip everything back down to the elemental level, a critic essentially is somebody who is a writer, you know. And so I feel like no matter how much I don't know, brilliant, the critic is. If you are not an engaging writer, I do not think you deserve your position, frankly. You know, so for me, that's, that's I mean, when it comes down to it, that's what I'm thinking about. As, of course, now that there's YouTube, there are people who speak to larger audiences, you know, but that's a different thing entirely. As far as I'm thinking about this as somebody who writes for a publication, I'm thinking that no matter the knowledge you come with, no matter where you're from, the one thing I feel like you need to at least take care of before we talk about anything else is, do I want to read what you have to say? You know, you could come with it, you could be the guy, I mean, I saw a documentary here, um, Tamaden, I don't know if you guys have seen it here, and I recognized um, clearly the guys in that film because I know some of them. <laughs> no, not of course personally, but I feel like what they are doing to get, I mean, it's an immigration, something about immigration, and these guys are people who are doing um, certain spiritual things to kind of make sure that they travel um, to Europe or to the US, actually to Europe mostly. And like I said, I grew up in Nigeria, so I know guys whose entire life is centered around the idea of we need to go to Europe. So I know that personally, and I'm sure a lot of people know that in Nigeria as well. They know these guys, like I said. If anybody showed that documentary in Nigeria and Lagos, people in the audience will be able to like say, you know what, I know five, six people who have this exact same thought about this, who have probably tried to go to Europe and couldn't go, came back, tried again, you know, just keep trying until probably they succeed or they don't succeed. But in any case, so I'm thinking to myself then that I'm not sure that even if everybody in the audience knows these guys, I want to read them, even if they have the social context, 
to discuss this thing. Because eventually, it's about how well can you tell me about the stuff you know on paper or on, well, on the screen. So for me, that's the basic thing you need to take care of. You can have all of the knowledge, you can read all of the films, you know everything about it, but if you can't string sentences together in a way that makes a reader want to read, I don't think you deserve to be paid. That's, that's my position. Finn? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, totally, I totally agree with what everyone has said, which just sounds like a cop-out, but I'll just add, because I'm on a trade, trade magazine, you know, I, I, I guess I'm lucky in a way in that I know exactly who my readers are or what I want the readers to be and the readers for the critics that we, um, we commission. And so we just try to um, contextualise its situation within the business w w uh, as well as everything else that you're speaking about. That's what, what we try to do. And, and I'm very aware of someone who's commissioning and writing that everyone is bringing their own perspective to that. So I'm trying to work with critics who have a knowledge and interest, because uh, um, no perspective is right. There's no right way or wrong way to do, to, to, to go about this or to, to you know, to interpret what the filmmaker is saying or try to communicate what you think the filmmaker is saying. It's just we all bring different different parts to it. And so, the, yeah, when, in that, if I look in the roster of critics that we use, I, I want it to be wider and, 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 and that's, you know, to, to get that in. And I feel that my magazine will die on the vine unless I get it, so, <laughs> you know. So that kind of goes back into what Katerina was saying, you know, that hopefully we will die on the vine if we don't, you know, if we don't move on, but yeah. Um, Katerina, I, I wonder if you find the function of, of criticism and the function of curation perhaps goes hand in hand. Is there a kind of programming that fosters better criticism? I mean, they totally go hand in hand, and, and I see it as, the, as part of the same um, same practice of, of film appreciation, just as, uh, as Giri said, and, and engagement, and to, to further conversations like in, initiated by by filmmakers and I I think it, like if I if I both in, in programming and when when writing or, or commenting in other contexts I, I think I, I that that is the the aim right to 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 further a conversation to to add a perspective but also not just to add because i'm so unique that only i can say a certain thing but more to to almost like you know, also echo and validate uh, talk to people who who are also not um, not heard in the same ways as as audience because i think the audience as a receiver of something has has an equally important role i mean the, the work is complete when it reaches the audiences so, so also to validate and and render visible points of views from that part and i was thinking about the in the intro when you're talking about the uh, the, the legendary ones um, from Cayenne to Cinema, etc. But, but those who talk with such authority, and I think that that I I've also been in that context, and I find that um, I end up often feeling it's hurtful because I realize that the way they talk so in with such insight, with such uh, everything that I share, and then they say something that proves that shows me, reminds me that oh, they don't even know that I exist, and if they knew, they wouldn't even care. So, so I think it's, it's like, um, I haven't said care now, it's, it's like care work also, like valid, seeing, seeing the film, seeing people talking, and seeing people seeing, it's kind of, um, when, when I think about it, what, what, I, what, I, what I care about, what I find is important. That's a really beautiful way to put it. Um, I wonder if, David, could you, you find the same thing about criticism and, and care go hand in hand in that way? Um, yeah, I mean, I'd like to maybe first say a little about what I think of as the function of criticism and uh, take a little bit of a grandiose stance uh, here, which is that I'm kind of always thinking about posterity uh, and I'm thinking about all kinds of journalistic writing, including criticism, as composing the record of our times. And to me, you know, that's how I'm able to find value in what I do and maintain perspective is that, uh, sorry, also sorry, 
my camera view keeps switching to myself, so I'm talking to myself. <laughs> Very unsettling. Um, I, I think that all kinds of journalism and criticism is both for the present and the future at the same time. So it's trying to make sense of our present as we live it. And so it's trying to make sense of film culture and media culture as we live it, because it's challenging to live through some, something um, and to bring the sense of the past and future to it. So as a critic, I'm always thinking about how can I bring history to bear on how I talk about the present, how I write about the present. And that's what sets like a professional critic apart from a casual critic or, you know, someone on social media, a commenter, is that a professional critic is bringing historical, cultural, global context and is able to place the object of criticism within that larger context. And at the same time, write with a view toward the future, or at least that's what I try to do, how will future generations look at this time? And how will what we write be a valuable record of the times? And that means that it has to be not just about the film, as Girish, you quoted Abby's essay, it has to be about the ecosystem and the culture around it. Only then I, do I think it would be a valuable record you know, for the future. And that is also why to me, diversity and inclusion is so important because if you look at the ways in which we think about history today and have been thinking about it for the last 50 years, we've been thinking about how limited the historical record is and how difficult it is to fill gaps in the record and how the fact that only some people were able to, um, you know, preserve, like create archives or some people were in charge of writing the narratives of history have, you know, skewed our perception of history. And it's still something we're working to subvert and to gain a fuller understanding of what came before us and you know how we as a society or culture were formed and so for me that's really important you know that we we think about right now you know how um how what we're kind of leaving behind and what sort of um yeah and what what kind of archives are we actively creating every day and in terms of Care work, I absolutely agree. I mean, the most accurate thing I've ever read about editing is that it's care labor. And this, I think, really tracks. I mean, Ben, I think you'll agree that, you know, editing is really, I, I find it incredibly rewarding. I love it. But it's also emotionally, you have to be very giving in order to be a good editor because you're working with, you know, you have to always remember that you're working with a full person. Uh, writing is not easy, putting yourself out there is not easy, and something that is often forgotten in today's very fast-paced uh, and transactional sphere of criticism is that, you know, e editing and publishing is, is a process of constant growth, and when a writer writes for publication, it should be an educational experience for them too, you know? The exchange between a writer and an editor should be one that promotes growth and nourishes the writing and truly gets to something, you know, better. And the problem is that everyone is extremely underpaid and everything is forced to be very fast and publications have the pressure to churn out content. And that really doesn't leave room for care. That doesn't leave room for care between people, you know, between editors and writers and other workers. And that doesn't leave room for care for the films or for the audience or for the readers. So. I, I said this yesterday, I mean, I, I feel like a vulgar materialist, but I think it like comes down so much to money and to, to funding because we are a society where in order to care for ourselves or for other people, we need to sustain ourselves and other people. And that comes down to how much money is in this business and there's very little. And so I, I'm constantly thinking about how to stay true to this idea of editing and writing as care labor and how to make room for that kind of genuine care while also, you know, being able to survive. And 
can I just just quickly say I, to, I, I, have, I really do agree with you here and, and there's also the issue too when you're trying to uh, work with writers and help writers and, and aware of the fact that writers, including yourself, you know, it's very exposing, you put your opinion out. I, at the end of the day, I try to say to people we're writing for is it's your opinion, you know, it's, you, you know, it's yours, don't worry, don't worry. But of course there's a lot to be worried about because see, it can be vicious out there and it can be misogynistic and it can be racist and some of this online commentary is absolutely bruising to people and it's... You know, it's, I sort of, I, I, I came across it last year myself, I, I got involved in something that, you know, just got, got, got out of control, but I've just seen, you know, writers and critics are individual people who've done their best to put something out there, and they can be just attacked, you know, and, and there's that as well. So, so you're, you're, you're talking about care, it's so important, you know. So important. Yeah, and just to, and, you know, quality and expertise are also formed by life experiences and, you know, everyone doesn't have access to the same kind of training and experience. Um, you know, that's, some, and that's like a tricky thing to keep in mind as an editor because you have limited time. You want to publish the best writers, you know, upholding quality is part of the job as an editor, upholding taste you know, good taste is part of the job of an editor or curator. And something I'm always struggling with is like how to how to um, how to think about taste in a way that also aligns with equity, because taste again is something that relies a little bit on exclusion, on judgment. So how do we make room for equity when we make judgments of taste and quality and recognize? that these ideas of taste are formed by, often by privilege, and that uh, notions of expertise and quality are also inflected by a lot of, you know, experiences of privilege. So that's something I feel like I struggle with a lot. Yes, um, I wanna, <clears throat> sorry, just to say something about the idea of um, criticism and archiving. Um, yeah, it's one of the things that really got that got me, in, I guess, interested in this <clears throat> was the idea that um, I think I got to the very first um, European festival I ever attended in 2015, and I think it was Rotterdam, and then the same year was Berlin. But yeah, I, I kept thinking all of the while that they were, I mean, like I said, Nollywood as a thing, that's Nigerian um, film culture essentially. Um, we think of it as something that started in 1992. Of course, it predates that, but generally speaking, we say 92. And sometime around 2010, 2015, I mean, just within like the past like 10, 20 years, a bunch of new filmmakers are showing up. And these are people who, maybe because of social media or because most of them went to film school, they are kind of plugged into the global um, cinema space in that <clears throat> you speak to somebody today and his hero is some random, um, I have a guy whose hero is Jodorowsky, for instance, and he's a Nollywood filmmaker. So you, there are all those kind of people who are, who are there, and most of them want to show their films at big European film festivals. And some of them do. But then I realized that even as this guy's ambition had gotten, I mean, at least a lot of the time, in time past, Nigerian filmmakers were making films for Nigerians, and I think also parts of the continent, maybe except Francophone um, Africa, that has had a very direct relationship, relationship with, with France. <clears throat> but otherwise, a lot of the guys from English-speaking Africa have always made films for their own people, so to speak. But, like I said, over the past 10, about 10, 15 years, that has changed. We have these filmmakers who really feel like they went to film school in the West. Guys went to UCL, you know, they went to all of these fancy schools, and they feel like it's not enough for them to only make films for Nigerians. And anyway, Nigerians are one of the people that travel a lot, so there's Nigerians everywhere, to be honest. But yeah, so I realized then that these guys were showing their films at some of these festivals, but almost always they were getting ignored. What that means is maybe there's, uh, maybe in Rotterdam, there are like six films from African filmmakers, mostly from the Maghreb, mostly from Tunisia, mostly from Algeria. But they may be just, you know, two guys, one guy from um, Nigeria, some other lady from Ghana or something, you know, from Sub-Saharan Africa. But every single time, none of these guys ever got what you assume you get at the festival, which is like free publicity. Because the major uh, papers were not sending their reporters, their critics, to write about these guys or their films. So what that, of course, meant was for me was like, okay, maybe there was something to be done about this. Because if you look at the history, if you check online, 
for films that probably were released in the past 10, 15 years, and the festivals that took place at that time, and the films that were covered at that time, you would hardly see any African film. Why? Because nobody cared about them. You know, so this idea of care is important in the sense that you have these filmmakers who are there, however, they are not getting written about. So in a certain sense, they're getting written out of the record of what has happened over the past 10, 15 years in film cinema, even if they were there, because nobody recorded this. this. So I figured that, okay, this was a thing that I, of course, like I said, I was really young and foolish. So I figured this was something that maybe I could change, you know? And then I realized that, okay, even if, it may, it may, I thought the problem was people weren't quite, um, what's the word? They didn't have enough education to talk about those films. But I realized that, you know, there was even something more insidious going on in the sense that people just didn't care that these guys were getting where we were there. So yeah, so in a sense, there is the idea of when you talk about diversity or representation, it's not really, it's not exclusively about changing what is, but also introducing something, like I said, new into it. Because I was, when I was growing up, my father was a huge fan of these violent American movies, Van Damme, Steven Seagal, all of them. And then I realized growing up that if I wanted to see what people thought about those films, those things were present. So all of these, all of these films you think of as ridiculous, that meant a lot to my, to my father, actually had somebody who recorded them, who wrote, wrote about these films. And then more important films, in quote, at least to me, are coming out in, in the past 10, 15 years, and absolutely nobody is doing the same for these films. So yeah, so there is that gap there, and I feel like, yes, that the idea of criticism as archiving has to be discussed within this particular context. Like, okay, who exactly is getting into those books and who isn't? Because these films exist. Most of these guys have shown in big festivals, but almost exclusively, there's no record that they actually showed up here, except, of course, you go back to the catalog of the festivals. Um, I think we might open up the floor for question from the audience. Um, if anyone has any question for the panelists. Oh. Sorry, I can't see you well. Yes, um, you in the back? Oh, are you raising your hand? Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, okay, if, um, if anyone has any point, any question, um, just let me know, but we can, I think one way to conclude this is um, to talk about the culture of scarcity in criticism when there are so few opportunities and there are a lot of people who are trying to make it in the industry and it can, it can make competitiveness um, between people faster. And I wonder if you ever felt that way in, in the business and how you perhaps overcome um, this feeling you have to be competitive with, with your um, colleagues. Or uh, how do you mean competitiveness? That's um, in the sense that there's a lot of people working and what? there are few outlets. Oh, and, okay. and when you're pitching, um, just sort of looking over your shoulder to see who gets what <laughs> you gets want what? or who doesn't get what. And I wonder if you ever feel that way, working in the business. Yeah, I don't know. This is so so very not comfortable talking about. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 but it's fine, but it's fine. I don't know. Let me see, you know. Uh, I don't know. It's such a tricky thing um, because, uh, okay, let me give a, let me give a story. <laughs> um, four years ago, I think, I was at... Um, this big festival in um, Francophone Africa. It's called Fespaco. It's, I think it's the oldest in Sub-Saharan Africa, I think, yes. Second oldest on the continent. But really old, 1969, that's when it started. And there was a, um, there was a journalist who is my friend, I think. <laughs> I hope, I still hope he's my friend. Uh, who was there to cover the festival for one of the trades, I can't remember which one, but for one of the trade magazines um, in the US. And I think I had met him earlier at um, another festival in, in, so in South Africa, in Durban. And at some point, because like I said, personally speaking, my heroes were these guys writing for Time Magazine, writing for Finance, all of those guys, you know. And so um, now that I was older, I felt, you know what, I would like to get published by these guys as well. And so I know this guy who is, um, like I said, a kind of friend of mine. And I asked him at some point, oh, um, there was this um, thing I wanted to write about for one of the trades. Um, was it possible to, I guess, if you could share like an editor's um, 
email, which is always a tricky thing, by the way, for critics, by the way. Always a tricky thing. So anyway, and then he looks at me <laughs> and tells me, do you want to take my job? Oh. You know? <laughs> so, so yeah, so it's, it's you know, and I, to be honest, immediately he said that, I understood. You know, it doesn't make it easier, to be honest, you know, because like I said, you have this ambition in your head as growing up as a young kid in Lagos, and you're like, you know what, maybe someday you can get into the New York Times or something, one of these fancy um, publications. But the fact of the matter is, like you said, there are people who are doing this, it looks, you know, and even if he was interested in this particular film I was talking about, the fact of the matter is, I guess he just didn't want the idea that there was somebody who could do this somewhere close by, you know. Of course, I can imagine that he has a job and he has a family and he has to take care of us. So it's really, really tricky. So yeah, I don't know. It's yeah. really tricky. Yeah. I wonder if that culture of scarcity has affected anyone here on the panel in any way, Devika? Um, yeah, I mean, this is something I have a lot of thoughts about because I really think scarcity is such a big problem. Leads to so much. I, I really do think it leads to a lot of uh, competitiveness. It pits us against each other in a way that just affirms, you know, institutions and allows them to get away with a lot of things. Institutions can get away with like paying us very little because of the assumption that critics are competing and not talking to each other. Not just critics, just workers, you know, in general. And I think it's especially harder as a person of color, obviously I'm speaking from my context in the US, which is where, um, you know, I didn't grow up here, but this is where I've worked, uh, which is that, you know, if you're a person of color, if you're one, you know, one of the one or two people at an institution, you have this fear that you'll be replaced by someone else, that there isn't room for more of you, you know, that there's room for like, the one person of color on staff or two, or the one woman of color on staff. And you are made to feel like you are replaceable and that, you know, and if someone else comes around then you're gone, that there is a room for more than one. But one thing that really influenced me was I sort of, one of my early forays into this business was through the New York Film Festival Critics Academy. I was, you know, um, part of its 2017 class and I had a colleague, Ru Noor, who's now a curator. She runs a micro cinema called uh, No Evil Lie. And when we all joined, she made, or she had this Google Doc that was specifically for uh, women and non-binary and queer critics with just collating editor, publication, and rate info. And she would just share it with everyone and then we would all start contributing to it, just a crowdsourced Google Doc that we just share with everyone in our circles. And this was such a small thing that had a very big impact on me, like early on, this idea that we were all emerging critics. So technically we're all competing, you know, for each other, with each other for like whatever uh, slots there are in the industry. But right off the bat, I had this example of, hey, we can do this as a community and not as an individual. And instead of competing right off the bat, we can share resources you know, with each other. And I think that completely changes your relationship to this work that allows you to advocate better for yourself. And that reminds me that at the end of the day, my goal is community because that's where, especially as people of color or marginalized critics, we can feel at home and do our best work when we're in community with like-minded people, you know? And I, uh, I've referenced like my institution unionized over the last year, um, that collective, that solidarity and collective bargaining has been really a wonderful experience to have. Again, it's really changed my understanding of my work and this industry and given me and my co-workers confidence to you know stand up as a unit and think about the ways in which the things we agree to harm others and ultimately harm us you know it all kind of comes back and there's a lot of great initiatives uh, like the freelance Sol solidarity project in the u.s uh, which is you know sort of a union-like concept. It's a, a collective of freelancers who you know, share resources and collectively advocate for standard rates and you know um, other kinds of like terms of, of freelance employment. And so these kinds of things give me a lot of hope and I feel like this is where I would want you know, crit the community of criticism to go and I think this could go a long way in addressing a lot of the problems we've been talking about. 
I think we started this um, flood and started this panel was saying that perhaps the problems are unsolvable. Um, but I think it's a lovely note that Divika has suggested. It started with the community. And I wonder if everyone else feels that even though the problems seem insurmountable, perhaps community is, is the starting point for, for us to change things. Katarina? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I'm, I'm seeing, if I, if I see what's happening on the, on the African continent, uh, where, where there's a federation, that I'm not part of it, but I see how they, I see them work with federation of, um, African Federation of Film Critics, for example. Um, and, and, and I think I, I see the same thing also here among filmmakers, uh, as well as operating the same way in a way. That the importance of um, of building an industry uh, in the first place, and that to build something, you actually have to work in community. And I see that among among film critics, the um, exchange of experience and contacts and mentorships, etc. And uh, yeah, that's definitely the only way. Uh, the only way for sustainability and justice and accuracy, the way we've talked about. Um, more, more yeah, durable way of dealing with things. I, I believe in that. I think I mean, we all, <laughs> human beings are human beings, and sometimes we struggle with solid. Often we struggle with solidarity and not panicking because we have rents to pay, etc. And I think also that's part of why I'm not a full-time film critic because I don't, I don't have the nerves and the, and the heart for, for that kind of, of um, competition. But I think definitely that. That, that is the way to go when it's happening. I don't know, friend. It just makes me laugh too that she said competition. Like you know, there's a contest going on somewhere. Like who is the chief? Who is the chief critic? Um, yeah, I think at least for us uh, in Nigeria, it's not a very developed space yet. I think of my generation, there's probably just three people I can think of, and one of them took a job in finance recently. So. <laughs> <laughs> So it's even less. So yeah. So the idea of um, but I think what we or what well maybe what I should be trying to do to be honest, to just of course as usual funding, is to even um, build up the capacity for people who probably want to do this because I think one of the things is I don't think everybody's pretty much like me who saw I don't know some white guy writing for Time magazine and said you know what I want to be that guy. Sometimes the most valuable part is somebody seeing you who is like him, Nigerian, grew up in Nigeria as well, um, as an example for this. But I find that, of course, because of the way we are structured, it's a very, I mean, like I said, poor country, so of course it means a lot of our thinking is about money, money, money. So it makes things a little bit um, difficult to get people who probably see this as even something that is worthy. And last year, the pandemic, I mean, I'm, this, I'm speaking especially as a critic, but also speaking generally as Right, any kind of writer that is not working in a bank or something, <laughs> those kind of writers. Last year, the pandemic pretty much erased a bunch of um, gains, I think, that we've made over the past, I don't know, like about a decade. You know, because Nigeria, we had like a lot of, um, what's the word, a lot of uh, military um, persons take over the government for years. And then sometime in 99, that kind of like changed into democracy. And so from that period, we had a lot of people who were writers become, I guess, kind of famous. People like Chimamanda, who I'm sure some people here are, are aware of. Um, she became famous. A bunch of other Nigerian writers also became um, famous. But fame is a tricky thing you know, for writers in Nigeria because a lot of it is almost lo really looking westward. So, but within the country, there was a community of writers who, of course, people working in criticism like myself, people working in the books business, people who are writing short stories, people who are doing all kinds of writings. And those guys essentially we used to have like a small community that's, I don't know, maybe every once in a while we meet somewhere and have these um, discussions. But of course, because of the pandemic last year, it meant that all of that pretty much got. I guess kind of erased in a way. So it's, stuff is coming back now, but it's so difficult to get I any mean, sort of community going. So if so, I'm thinking to myself that what would probably work is probably some kind of, I guess, a workshop, maybe a panel like this, you know, to kind of bring everybody back together. But it's a bit difficult because, of course, there is no quite, there's not quite enough 
There's, in fact, there's no funding, actually, for stuff like that. So what we have built over the past few years, organically, is pretty much sort of like in a decline. So yeah, so I think, yeah, community is the way to go about it. And um, hopefully, if we could reach across to the West, it might help. Girish? Um, to say something just from my own uh, location, which is in academia, um, I'm very interested in kind of cross-pollination, cross-fertilization exchange between academia, which often tends to be in its own little silo uh, between, between academia and the larger world, including uh, critics um, and curators and the kind of industry ecosystem. And I think there's a lot um, for these two communities, uh, the critical community and then the scholarly community to kind of learn from each other and teach each other. And um, I think social media has opened the way for that. Uh, there are many scholars who are interested in kind of trying to foster that dialogue. And at Film Quarterly, we try to do a little bit of that. And so I, I feel a great deal of excitement about the promise of how these two communities can come together, grow, and um, there's a lot of potential for rich uh, criticism there, I think. I think we're all very hopeful, um, which is lovely. Um, I wonder if anyone in, in Iran has a question now and can answer them. Oh. Oh, yes. yes. Oh, okay, yes, yes. Um, do you need Hi. Hi, Katrina. So, Johannesburg, fellow Johannesburger. Um, as an artist who I think has always longed to have like a meaningful relationship with a critic, I'm wondering uh, to what extent you feel process-led, process a process-led approach to criticism and a collaborative approach to, collab to criticism. I'm just wondering what space is in terms of your practices. I know you've brought up a lot of uh, questions about deadlines and delivery and thank you. And uh, what's required and what's wanted and what's needed. But I'm wondering what the place is for you all in your individual practices is for uh, something that is process led uh, or collaborative with the project or the people that you are critiquing. Yeah, thank you. Oh, okay. sure. Look, I feel like I feel like there are multiple perspectives. There is the, I guess, there is the regular journalist perspective, but I think there's also the academic perspective on this. And I think for most, I think they have probably the greatest leeway to do what you're suggesting than the guys who are probably working, especially as critics for like the regular publications, because I mean, like you just pointed out. There's the thing about, about deadlines, but even beyond that, I think that we need to think of criticism as not, it's not the only kind of journalistic coverage that's possible for, um, for film, you know? Regular papers, at least, generally speaking, in regular papers, there's a critic section, there's also the guys who do features. So a lot of what you're talking about, for instance, works best with the critic who also writes kind of features, you know? That kind of like a piece where, we speak to you. In fact, funny enough, it's kind of what they do in Rotterdam during the Young Critics um, program, where the um, the critic is required to speak to the filmmaker, and then pretty much walk through the filmmaker's vision after seeing the film, or rather before seeing the film, you know, to produce a piece of text based on what the filmmaker has said he or she is trying to achieve on the big screen. So I think there is a space for that, but the idea of reviews, essentially, at least in the journalistic way, is just this is what is on the screen. Talk about it with what you know about either your life or about the filmmakers or other password and stuff. So it's a bit, it's a tricky thing. The review system doesn't really permit that per se, but like the more hybrid feature kind of journalism is what really allows that happen. From this, I'm speaking purely from the, the regular media journalist's perspective. Like I said, the guys in academia, of course, they can spend an entire semester walking through your stuff with you, I think. So please, maybe Girish. No, I think that's spot on. Um, 
And you're right, uh, academics do have the luxury of dev devoting months to a particular essay on a, a, you know, on a particular film and interacting with the filmmaker. And uh, one of the things that um, a burden that is lifted from academic writers is that of explicit evaluation. So it's almost beyond the evaluation. Of course, there is a certain element of evaluation. It's a prerequisite to choosing the object, you know? But then that's implicit and not really considered or not really explained uh, or not much time is spent on There's explaining. There's no five stars. You guys don't do five stars. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> or the five stars is embedded somewhere where you, where you can't see it. Um, or sometimes a zero stars are embedded somewhere where it's like a critical takedown, you know? Um, um, but so, yeah, yeah th there's a certain kind of writing that's possible in collaboration with the artist, advocating for the artist, or um, a kind of criticism that I, I wish that was more possible in, um, by, by, uh, by working critics, which is something that Devika alluded to, which is uh, providing a deep context around the work that helps you appreciate it better. Too much of evaluation, uh, uh, relies on what's on the screen and what's heard. Uh, and sometimes that evaluation can change if we learn about the context. So something beyond, behind the screen can actually change what you think of, the, of what you see on the screen. Um, so I think, yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, academics have that luxury to do that. Does this answer, the, uh, answer your question? Um, I think, so oh, Katrina yeah. and I were yeah, maybe yes. going to say Katrina, the same thing, yeah, yeah. but we didn't hear the question. Oh, sorry. Um, so the question is um, for each of you, um, how, how do you in your practice sort of balance your own individual approach to criticism, but also engage in it in a collaborative way um, with, with, with the filmmakers or with other critics? Is there a possibility to produce work that feel collaborative? If I can, uh, can, I, can I speak? Yeah, yeah, yeah. go ahead. No, uh, I mean, one thing is, because I was talking about uh, how I define criticism as furthering the conversation, but it also it doesn't have to be furthering after the filmmaker has said everything, and then I come in and say, uh, or, or other critics, but it's also being part of, of, a, of a conversation that can start while the film is being made or just after and and especially i mean i i, I think i slightly disagree with you or is because uh, i think i mean there are angles and that's why it's again that's also diversity we don't approach film criticism the same way and say the exact same same thing about the same things i see certain things i take a particular interest in in certain aspects that that others might not and that might no, be knowing a body of work, for example, and that I approach my, my analysis and my engagement, I, 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 I ground it in a body of work, in, in previous practices by that filmmaker, etc. Filmmakers, etc. And um, yeah, there, there's so many, and, and yeah, like I said, conversations during, right after, and in collaboration. And I think we talked yesterday about uh, the, this blurring of lines, but I don't think that, that that is not a blurring of line because there's no such thing as objectivity. We all, we are, I mean, at least then I am, and I think that we, we are invested, we are invested in the story. We are invested in the craft we are invested in. So I think, I think that that is just, um, that's part of the community we were talking about before. Thank you. Tibika, you want to add anything or? Um, not much to add. Yeah. I think uh, the responses covered everything. I mean, I do think that, you know, criticism and writing in general can be a very solipsistic um, task and profession. Uh, you know, it could be lonely, but also there's so much emphasis placed on finding your voice, which is, obviously important that is part of the process but that can harden into this idea of you know you need to have a stance you need to have a brand you need to have this watertight idea of who you are as a critic and what you're trying to say and which filmmakers you love and which filmmakers you hate and you know that's something i uh, feel like I, i've been trying to work against a little bit and again for critics of color and marginalized critics 
the burden can feel heavier, you know, to, uh, to really define yourself in that way and seem authoritative. Um, and I just, this is why I think the idea of like being open to growth, like making space for growth in the criticism industry is so important because I think people should not feel that they have to come in fully formed and they should feel that they can form themselves and their ideas in conversation with others. Editing allows me to be a very collaborative uh, in a way that I enjoy. Um, and I, I really think that that's a space where growth should be encouraged. I also um, host a podcast uh, along with my co-editor at Film Comment. I found that to be a really wonderful space uh, of looser collaborative criticism where something is created, you know, um, in the exchange between critics as opposed to like sitting in front of a computer and thinking, you know, what do I have to say about this movie? And I just want to say what Girish mentioned about deep context is really important to um, and a, a really actually good example of collaboration that maybe we don't think of as collaboration um, is I don't think everything you write needs to be in conversation with the filmmakers and, you know, with the behind the scenes aspect of the film. But there is something to be said about uh, being open to that as a critic and being open to something more than you know your experience of the film in the theater and i think about this a lot especially when people make political assessments of film especially documentaries i don't actually think you can assess the ethics or politics of a documentary if you don't know the relationship between the filmmaker and the subject questions of access you know questions of compensation and so in these cases, I, I, that's why I love attending festivals and I wish I was there in person because you can talk to people and like have this forum that can feed into what is ultimately kind of a lowly and solipsistic and insular task and profession. So, yeah. Are we allowed to take another question? Or if there's one? Okay. <laughs> Thank, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I'm, I'm and thankful to all the panelists um, for your fairly insightful um, discussion. And I'm, I'm glad that we end on the notes of, I think, hope and optimism and community. And that's why we own here at IDFA and virtual together. Um, so thank you so much.